My name is Elaine Bernard. I'm the executive director of the Labor and Work Life Program and the Harvard Trade Union Program, which is in session here for six weeks. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Jerry Wirth Memorial Forum, which is our first forum of the Harvard Trade Union Program. I will uh, uh, allow our guest speakers to talk a little bit about Jerry Wirth. But let me start by introducing Mayor uh, Mar Martin Walsh. Mayor Walsh is, of course, a lifelong advocate for working people and a proud product of the city of Boston. So I want to welcome Mayor Walsh uh, to, to the... Uh, <laughs> Our fair city of Cambridge. He's the 54th uh, mayor of Massachusetts, uh, Boston, and was uh, uh, became mayor in January of uh, uh, 2014. Before taking office, Mayor Walsh served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Uh, he represented Boston's diverse 13 Suffolk district. He was a leader on job creation and workers' protection, substance abuse mental health and homelessness, K-12 education and civil rights. While working full-time as a legislator, he returned to school to earn a degree in political science at Boston College, a, a real model to us all. Mayor Walsh also made his mark as a labor leader in this area, beginning with the Labor's uh, Local 223 here in Boston. He rose to head the Building and Construction Trades Council of the Metropolitan District, and from 2011 to 2013. There he worked with business and community leaders to promote high quality development and career opportunities uh, for all of us, for women, for people of color. So please welcome Mayor Marty Walsh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, and I want to uh, Elaine, thank you for that introduction, and I want to thank everyone at the Harvard Labor Work Life Program, uh, and greetings to all the leaders here from the Harvard Trade Union Program this week. Thank you for being here today, uh, and it's great to be in a friendly room. Uh, I want to also congratulate members of the Harvard Union cre uh, Clerical and, and Technical Work as represented by AFSCME, who's here with us today, so thank you very much as well. I certainly know and I want to thank all of the workers who uh, make this great institution run and who made today's uh, event possible. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the great local leaders that we have here also who work for Ask Me Council 93. Uh, we have Frank Maroney, I think he's here. He should be here. There's Frank. And next to Frank is Charlie Owens. I want to thank Charlie. And I don't know if Mark Bernard's here, but Mark, I didn't see him. He's out in the hallway on the phone doing work probably. Hopefully you're not filing a grievance against any city and city hall stuff, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you very much. I also want to, uh, it's a privilege for me to be today uh, to speak in honor of great labor leaders like the past, like Jerry Wolf, and his wife is here with us today and his daughter, so I want to thank you very much uh, for being here with us. And the great labor leaders present, like Lee Saunders, um, you know, the, the labor movement played a very important role in my life. Um, I wouldn't be standing here today without it. Uh, there's no question about it. I, I'm very proud of that. I talk about it all the time. Uh, there are certain numbers that, that mean an awful lot to people in life, and uh, it's particularly like in sports, you know, past sports heroes like number four, Bobby Orr, or current sport heroes like number 12, Tom Brady, and, uh, and because the president is next to me, number 23, LeBron James from Cleveland, so <laughs> I want to throw that. But uh, some of the earliest memories for me uh, of numbers is 223. Uh, that had a special ring to it, and it had a special ring to it because it was the, the local union that my father belonged to uh, when he came out to this country, uh, the Labor's Union. Uh, and before I knew what the labor movement was, I knew that, I, uh, that it was being part of the union uh, was a bigger calling, something bigger that you joined. And as I grew older, it meant a lot more to me. I followed my father into the Labor's Union. I got my first job uh, one of the summers uh, while I was in high school. I worked at the Commonwealth Pier, which is now the World Trade Center, when they were doing over in the beginning. Um, and I worked on that job. And then uh, to this day, uh, after being a state representative um, and led the building trades, as was mentioned earlier, and Brian Doherty, the person who followed me in the building trades, is here today. 
uh, in two years as mayor, I still belong to Labor's Local 223. Uh, I carry my union book in my pocket. I am proud of it. I am proud of who I am. Uh, when I ran for mayor of the city, uh, a lot of people tried to say that because of my affiliation with labor and what I've done, I can't be an effective leader. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about what we've done here in the city of Boston, or in the, there in the city of Boston, but we've done a lot. We've done an awful lot in our city. Um, you know, my experience with labor helped me build consensus amongst different, different constituencies. Uh, it's made me a, a strong manager in a positive way. Uh, I've took the Office of Labor Relations in the city of Boston uh, that was uh, adversarial for many years with different people and turned it into something that to really negotiate and establish trust with workers and, and with leaders to talk about how do we move the agendas forward. It's had a dramatic effect. Uh, we not only settled contracts, but we achieved uh, the first city's first ever perfect bond rating on both Sanders and Poor's and Moody's over the last two years. Uh, we showed how we can have strong fiscal uh, positions, and we can also stand to make sure that workers have security and workers get paid a fair wage. Furthermore, public employees, for me, have made it possible for groundbreaking public innovations in City Hall as well. Uh, police officers, firefighters, EMT, EMTs uh, all got trained and are carrying Narcan in their vehicles uh, to protect people that are overdosing. Uh, we're able to do that by having a conversation. It wasn't a knockdown, drag out fight, it was a conversation. And everyone said, it will make sense, let's do it. We were able to do it. With our teachers, we're able to sit down and talk with our teachers and work on a plan to extend the learning time in the Boston Public Schools by 11%. Um, oftentimes, Boston was criticized of having the shorter school day. We don't have the shorter school day anymore, and we're working on ways of implementing that, sitting down. With our parks employees, we're adding new public spaces and inclusive playground equipment. We're making sure that our parks, not are just parks for kids, but they're also inclusive so any kid can go into those parks and play. We'll make possible, our, all this is because of our relationship with our public employees. And that's something that I'm very proud of. So when I see public employees under attack around the country, I shake my head. I have an opportunity because I sit at a lot of tables with mayors and they'll say, well, how do you have such a relationship with your fire department? How do you have a, such a relationship with, with, with AFSCME? How do you have a, such a relationship? Because it's, it's a fair conversation. That doesn't mean we're not going to have disagreements. It doesn't mean we're not going to have arguments. It doesn't mean that we're not going to fight about things. It doesn't mean that that's going to happen because that's going to happen in life. But it's an opportunity for us to make sure that we, 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 what I see what's happening around the country is people trying to drive wages down. Not here in Boston, we're trying to lift people up. We know the decline of the middle class. Thank you. The de decline of the middle class in America, we see the raise of inequality. We also see a decline in union membership. So you can see the, the, the combination there. As you see the decline in membership, you see the growing inequality numbers that are happening. And they're happening every single day. You know, I think it's important that we, how we restore the middle class and make the American economy work for everyone. We need to continue to work together. And that's why I wanted to be here to listen and learn more from Lee Saunders. President, Lee, President Saunders is one of the most effective advocates for public sector private workers today. If you look at his experience, you can certainly see why. Since joining AFSCME in 1978, he's been a labor economist and research director, so he understands why our economy and the needs of the workforce, something that's very, very important. He directed the community action organization and field services so he knows the, what individual workers' needs are and how to bring them together. I had the opportunity to hear the president speak at a rally for Elizabeth Warren, then candidate Elizabeth Warren at the Painters Union Hall. And I had a chance to hear him talk. And what he was talking about that day was talking about workers' rights and fundamental rights that, that are being lost in the country. And he talked about the protections that workers need and why how people need advocates to fight for the working class people. And it's something that's important. Even in this presidential election that's going on, we're hearing a lot about the economy, and that's important. But we're not hearing a lot about workers' rights. We're not hearing a lot about what, what the middle class is all about. We're talking about creating middle class jobs, and that's a little different but what workers' rights are all about. So he has certainly done so much. Administrator of AFSCME locals and councils across the country, he knows the importance of sound management. So when you talk about labor leaders and somebody who understands that can go in to a boardroom and talk to the board members about the economy, but also talk about workers' rights, that's what we need in this country. It's been an honor for me to meet with and, and sit with Lee and watch him and see him on the campaign trail and fighting for workers, worker, workers hard. He understands that having the right arguments isn't enough. 
behind this advocacy has to, has to be a body of work that, organize, that workers are organized and employed. That's what the, the, the Freed Ricks, sorry, Freed Ricks, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> Freed Ricks in the Supreme Court, case of the Supreme Court is all about. It's an effort to splinter that power and undercut the voice. That's why I signed my name onto an amicus brief opposing it. <laughs> it doesn't take a complicated legal argument to understand why a worker's voice should be heard. We shouldn't be doing that, and today it's, it's sad what's happening. I know in my bones and I know my earliest memories, I see the proof every day in the employees of the city of Boston. I am proud to say on the occasion that nearly 2,000 of the employees that work with me in City Hall are affiliates of AFSCME Council 93. So I want to thank you for that. I'm getting a lot of, a lot of credit in the City of Boston for transforming a lot of things. From parks, we had the largest budget in parks history this year in past budget. Transportation, we're looking at a master plan on how we do, how we do a master planning of transportation and the problems of transportation. Food and nutrition, we're working on making sure the food in our city for the kids in our schools is better. We're making sure that our building inspectors, we've changed some policies so that building inspectors are looking out for the rights of people that live in apartments and buildings in the city of Boston. We have health inspectors out in the street making sure that our restaurants are clean and making sure that the services that are delivered to the public are there. We also have safety engineers working out there making sure that our city's safe. Every single one of those industries I just talked about are represented by AFSCME Council 93. So when we talk about making changes, when we talk about making changes, it's not simply making changes in a mayor's office with his cabinet, it's making sure that the people that are carrying out those changes understand too. And the reason why we're getting the credit isn't because we came up with these ideas, it's because of the professionalism of the city employees. Our great city and historic city could not run without them and its great historic union belongs to them, led by a great historic president, Lee Saunders. Like me, Lou, Lou, Lee grew up in a union household. His father was a bus driver with amalgamated transit union in Cleveland, Ohio. His mother was a community college professor belonging to the American Association of University Professors. Lee joined the Ohio Civil Service Employees Association in 1975 after earning his master's degree from Ohio State. So both Lee and his mother are proof that workers with college degrees can benefit with union memberships. Though the roles I mentioned earlier, Lee rose to become executive assistant to the president and secretary treasurer of AFSCME. And at the AFSCME's 40th International Convention in 2012, he was elected its president. He's the first African American to serve in this role. As president, Lee has been a champion of AFSCME New Wave Initiative to develop a new generation of union leaders. And that's another thing that often we don't hear in the labor movement, people talking about the future. And he's talking about bringing in new workers and new people to understand the importance of them getting involved in the union, but not also getting involved in the union, but rising to the top of that union. And that's what we have to continue to talk about. He did, he's advanced pro programs to foster diversity and increase membership, membership participation. And for those of you in the room that don't understand what that means, that means that you just simply don't have a union book in your pocket. You're actually involved in your union. You're involved in the movement in that union. Something that's important. I believe, and I've said many times, this is exactly the direction the labor movement needs to take if we are to remain a relevant force in the lives of the American working class. Ask me under the Lee is leading the way towards a stronger labor movement, a stronger workforce, and a more equal America. Lee's talk today is titled, The Value of Labor, Transforming Unions to Meet the Challenges of Our Time. There could be probably no truer statement today that we need to hear about. Transforming unions to meet the challenging needs of our time. Too many of our unions, brothers and sisters, were stuck in a way of operating for too many years. And it's important for us now to start to think different. And I look forward to hearing Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, friends in labor, brothers and sisters, it's my deep honor to do, introduce to you this year's sp speaker at the Jerry Wolf Memorial Forum, the president of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Lee Saunders. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Everybody okay? I want to thank you for providing me the opportunity to fly out of snow country in Washington, D.C. and come to Boston. Normally, it's the other way around, isn't it? Huh? Where you fly out of Boston where there's a lot of snow. There's nothing on the ground here. We got about 30 inches in Washington, and they don't do it. They don't clear the snow too well, but I was able to make it. So I'm glad to be here. I want to I thank the mayor, Marty Walsh, for that introduction and for being in the vanguard of mayoral leadership across the country that seeks dignity for workers and within unions and outside of unions. I mean, I am so happy and pleased that we have a progressive mayor in the city of Boston who believes in progressive values, who believes in supporting working families. Give him a round of applause for what he does every single day. You know, we, we stood with Marty when he was running for mayor. We stand with him now, and I'm glad that he is standing with all of us. Now, I better do a couple of things before I get into the text of my remarks. I got some important people that are in the audience, and that's my AFSCME family. We've got folks here from Council 93, our International Vice President, Executive Director of Council 93, some of his executive officers and staff. Frank Maroney's in the room. Give Frank a round of applause for what he does. We've got a, a whole crew of AFSCME folks in the house. I see the the council director, executive director of Council 20 in Washington, D.C., was participating in this program. Andrew Washington is here. <laughs> We've even got folks from Rhode Island, Brother Danny. Where's, where, where's, all right, all right. He is the president of Council 94 in Rhode Island. I know I'm going to be missing some, some folks, but let me say this, and this is important for what I'm about to say. We have a group of sisters and brothers uh, who represent technical and administrative personnel at Harvard University. And they have been negotiating for, I guess, the past year on a new contract. And I guess it was last week, Chris, Donnie, last week, you were able to achieve a victory for workers at this university by negotiating a contract that has substantial wage increases, keeps health benefits in place, and as a matter of fact, for those making less than $55,000 a year, it lowers their premium for health insurance. So give them a round of applause for what they do. How to? Harvard Union of Clerical and Technical Employees, a part, a part of the AFSCME family. I want to acknowledge and give a special thank you to someone who I've known essentially since I've been working at AFSCME, and that's been going on 38 years. I started working at the union when I was five years old. <laughs> they didn't have child labor laws then, okay? But I've known Mildred Worth for, for all of that time, and she's here. She was Jerry Worth's partner and wife, she moved him and consulted with him and guided him in his path in the labor movement. So give Mildred a round of applause. And her daughter is also here. I also want to thank Elaine Bernard, Executive Director of the Harvard Trade Union Program. Where's Elaine? She got a pretty good applause, didn't she, huh? She must be doing some good stuff. Good stuff. You know, as president of the 1.6 million member American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, I'm honored to deliver this lecture named for a great labor leader, former President Jerry Worth. You know, since I've been around for going on 38 years, I had the pleasure of knowing Jerry, knowing him personally, working with him closely learning from him. For those of you who did not have that pleasure, let me just paint a brief picture. Jerry Worth was a ferocious warrior, and that is no understatement. You never crossed Jerry Worth. If you did, shame on you. 
He was a ferocious warrior for the working class, especially, especially for those who worked in the public service. He was president of AFSCME for nearly two decades. During those years, he led the union in a major strategic shift that had really three important characteristics. First, Jerry would always argue that public service workers face the same oppressive conditions and deserve the same kinds of rights, the same level of representation as their private sector counterparts, including the right to negotiate on equal terms with their employers for a union contract. I don't know if a lot of you realize that, but at one time, even in the private sector, with our sisters and brothers in the private sector union movement, they didn't believe that, some of them anyway, didn't believe that public service workers should have the right to organize. Jerry changed all of that. He changed all of that through his commitment and dedication and aggressiveness in supporting the work of public service employees. Second, he agitated. He agitated public workers to take direct action in support of their demands, to act like a union, even if they didn't have legal recognition. And finally, he made the case that our mission in the union is about power. It's about power. It's about shifting power from employers to the worker. He believed in those concepts, and he lived them every single day. He led the union through one of its greatest challenges. That was a sanitation worker's strike in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. 1,300 African-American workers, sanitation workers, who went on strike for not only better wages and better working conditions, but they went on strike for dignity and respect on the job. And Jerry traveled to Memphis many times to support that strike. And all of you know the story. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. traveled to Memphis, supported that strike of sanitation workers in the Deep South under threats the possibility of loss of life, and ultimately Dr. King gave his life in support of those sanitation workers, in support of that strike of those brave AFSCME members. Dr. King understood the importance of linking civil rights, human rights, labor rights, and economic rights. He linked those because one cannot go without the other. It's all a collective. It's all together. More than 45 years have passed. You know what? We find ourselves at another critical time, not only for the, the United States labor movement, our labor movement, the movement that we love, but for worker, working families across this country. You know too well the history of the attacks on the labor movement and the deliberate attempt, the planned attempts, the coordinated attempts to undermine progress for working people. It's happening right now. It's been going on and being planned for a long, long time, and it's actually starting to come to fruition. When I was flying up on a plane this morning. There were some new statistics out that showed that Union membership in this country is stagnant. It's about where it was a year, two, three years ago. In the private sector, union membership is at 6.7%. In the public sector, union membership is at about 35%. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why we have a bullseye on our backs because we still have resources, we still have power, we still have strength. They're trying to take that away from us. 
What's happening in this country right now is pure and simple a power play. It's a power play for those who have wealth and want more wealth. It's a power play of those who have power and want more power at the expense of the 99.5% who are trying to play by the rules every single day, put food on the table, send their kids to school. This well-orchestrated attack spanning more than 40 years ago was very clearly laid out in what we labor and now refer to as the infamous Powell Memo. Some of you have probably heard about that. Some of you may not. This plan of attack was hatched by a corporate lawyer named Lewis Powell and drafted for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce just before he was appointed. Now get this, just before he was appointed to the United States Supreme Court. Isn't that ironic? As we consider labor's attack beginning with a man who would become a Supreme Court justice, isn't it interesting that today, in 2016, that the latest attack on working people comes in the form of a Supreme Court case? You heard the mayor mention this, Friedrich versus the California Teachers Association. It was argued just about three weeks ago on a Monday, and it seeks to overturn a longstanding precedent set forth in a 1977 case called Abood versus the Board of Education. In that precedent-setting case, the court unanimously affirmed that it is constitutional. It is constitutional for all employees who are represented by a union in the public sector to share the cost of representation and negotiations, even if they choose not to join. I want to be clear. No one is forced to join a union. But when the majority of people vote to form a union, the union is required by law to represent everyone in the workplace, whether that employee is a union member or not. So all public employees enjoy the benefits, job security, and other protections the union negotiates. I think it's only fair. It's only fair that all employees contribute to the cost of securing those benefits, securing those protections. I think it's only right. I'd like, to, I'd like to use this analogy when talking about this. Think of it like going out to dinner with friends. If you go to dinner, you chip in. Even if you didn't like the restaurant that was selected, that your friends chose. But if you eat the food, you chip in. Same concept, the same exact concept. So why is this long-time precedent suddenly being reconsidered? Let's take a look at this. Let's really investigate this. Let's do a little bit of research. Marty talked about me coming from the research department. I see Jim Schmitz, who was our director of organizing and field services sitting in the audience. He retired. Maybe he was smart to doing that about three, four years ago. I was talking to Jerry McEntee, our past president, and he said, I think I got out about the right time, Lee. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Maybe Jerry did, but I'm going to fight like hell every single day for the trade union movement in this country, and I'm going to continue to fight. <clears throat> but let's look. let's look at the history here. Who's behind Friedrichs? The kind of people, the kind of organizations. The Center for Individual Rights was formed in 1989 to push a conservative legal agenda, especially on civil rights. They brought us the attack on affirmative action admission standards at the University of Texas Law School. They're the folks who recruited plaintiffs to overturn the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And they're the folks who round up money from conservative foundations, bankrolled by guess who? 
the Koch brothers, to push this anti-civil rights, anti-worker, anti-democracy agenda. Now they've turned their attention to workers' rights, to attacking workers' rights, especially workers' rights in the public sector, where people of color and particularly African-American families have found a pathway to the middle class. Now for me, that fact isn't just a talking point. It's actually my life experience. Marty mentioned that I'm from Cleveland. I grew up in Cleveland in the 1950s and 1960s. And back then, the only way that African American families could get ahead to move into the middle class it was really to work in three occupations in the city of Cleveland. The first was becoming a bus driver. The second was postal service. The third was working in the steel mills. Now what do all of those have in common? They were all organized with a strong union contract and with union benefits. My dad was a, was a bus driver, proud bus driver. He was a proud member of the Amalgamated Transit Union. And because of that union job, my family was, was, able to, was able to get by. We didn't have to worry about going broke from getting sick because we had health care. We didn't have health care. We had health care because of that strong and good union contract. When my father retired, he did so in dignity, thanks to that position. I was able to go to school because of ATU and what they were able to negotiate for their workers. So it should come as no surprise that an organization like the Center for Individual Rights, which has long attacked civil rights, they've been attacking voting rights, and has even taken money from the Pioneer Fund, a foundation that supports white supremacist causes, would turn its attention to workers' rights. We've got to understand who is attacking us, who they are, and what they believe in. You see, so-called right-to-work policies were not developed by benevolent do-gooders who wanted to spread their love of freedom and democracy to the American workplace. It didn't happen that way at all. Rather, the roots of right to work lie with individuals like a guy named Vance Hughes, a mid-century oil lobbyist and avowed segregationist. In the 1940s, Muse started an organization called the Christian American Association, which opposed an array of pro-worker causes including the, the eight-hour day and the right for workers to have the ability to organize collectively. He opposed all of those things. In fact, Muse once said derisively of the union movement, get this, this is a direct quote, from now on, white women and white men will be forced into organizations with black African apes whom they will have to call brother or lose their jobs. The father of right to work. Mewson, the Christian American Association, got their so-called right to work law passed in Texas in 1947. And within two years, 14 southern states had enacted right to work legislation, moved it into law. Now, I would suggest to you that too few Americans know the roots of right to work. If they did, one wonders whether we would be here where we are today. Not 15 states, but now 25 states are right to work states. With the real possibility, in 2016, we could add three or four more. Possibility in West Virginia. 
Missouri. They're going to try to do it in Ohio. The struggle continues. So why does the Supreme Court now want to get into the act? Why do they want to attack the public sector? Why do they want to be on the side of those who want to take rights away from us? Want to take collective bargaining away from us? Steal our voices so that we become powerless rather than becoming more powerful? It matters because a Friedrich's case will have a huge impact on all working people, whether they belong to unions or they don't. It's another thumb on the scale of an unbalanced economy, an economy in which a few wealthy families control the overwhelming majority of the wealth in this country. The Supreme Court rules for the plaintiff in the Friedrich's case, it will make all of this even worse. Why? Because organized labor remains the most well-organized resistance, even though we are struggling right now. Our percentages are lower, but we still remain the most organized resistance to rampant corporate greed. Now, make no mistake, Friedrichs is not about union dues. It's not about union fees. That's what they would like you to believe. That's what they talk about all the time. You don't have to pay your union dues. It's all about money coming into the, into the union so they have the ability to do what they want to do. It's not about that at all. It's about powerful corporate, corporate interests who want to manipulate. They want to manipulate the economic rules even more in their favor by making it harder for a university employee a librarian, a social worker, child care worker, sanitation worker, to come together to speak up, to get ahead. It's about promoting a so-called gig economy, where we are falsely told that driving down wages and denying people good health care and a secure retirement are the only pathway to economic innovation and on-demand convenience. That's the only way that you can achieve those goals by pushing people down, decreasing wages, attacking retirement security in this country. It's about giving aid and comfort to the minuscule few who quietly cheer. It's tens and millions, tens of millions helplessly shrug. As academics document America's slide from a democracy to a plutocracy. But guess what? Despite the best efforts of these forces over decades, actually the popularity of unions is starting to increase. It's starting to rise. According to Gallup's annual survey, unions saw a 5% jump in favorability last year to 58% the highest level of support since 2008. Now, it would be nice to think that increase in support is a sign that working people through organized labor will ultimately prevail. But you and I both know that that just is not enough. We can't kid ourselves. We can't fool ourselves. Rather, if we are to prevail, then I submit to you what Long past time that labor leaders, including me, all of us, we've got to undertake an honest critique of labor's role in America today and whether we are prepared to, to face the challenges that confront all of us today and in the future. You know, I travel all over the country speaking to AFSCME affiliates and working people, union members. And I sometimes tell our affiliates that as president of AFSCME, I feel like I'm sometimes driving around in a 1957 Chevy. Now let me be clear. Those of you who were around in 1957 will remember that that was a great car. 
It was a great car. An antique. That was 1957. This is 2016. It is not a great car today. Labor, all of labor, has to develop a new model because it is 2016. We've got to look honestly at ourselves. We must build on the things that, that work well and that will continue to work. But we've also got to be honest enough and bold enough to consider and discard the things that don't work well, the things that are broken that we must fix. To build on the things that made us strong, we must examine collective bargaining as a model. Now, I know there's a lot of discussion, a lot of dialogue about the importance of collective bargaining in this country. I understand that some in the labor movement today believe we live in a post-collective bargaining world where we will lose collective bargaining and not have it. And we've got to think of another form, another way to deal with workers' issues. Well, I encourage us to think outside the box and explore new models of organizing. But I believe this, that collective bargaining is key and it must be a part of our future. It must be a part of our future. The reason is simple. Even in so-called right-to-work jurisdictions, collective bargaining remains one of the most effective tools to reduce income inequality. Let's take a look at a couple of examples to prove my point. Look at how home care workers across this country starting to organize. More than 15 years ago, AFSME and SCIU set about organizing home care providers in the state of California. At the time, home care workers in California had to contend with low pay and absolutely no benefits, zero. They were even excluded from the Fair Labor Standards Act, meaning they were not entitled to overtime protections. We organized those workers along with SEIU, and now home care workers have won dramatic gains, which have reduced turnover and improved the quality of care, the quality of home care in that state. We've been able to increase wages by negotiations, by collective bargaining, by 62 percent from 2003 to 2010 in many of those California counties. We began providing free and low-cost trainings for thousands of providers on vital topics like CPR and first aid through their training center. We actually established a training center for home care workers. Today, turnover in California is half the national average. And you know what? A more stable workforce means better quality services for those who rely on home care services. Beyond an increased standard of living and better service for clients, home care workers now are empowered. They feel good about themselves. They think that they have a chance through collective bargaining, through organization, through collective action. And they speak out on the big issues that affect them every single day. When Schwarzenegger, when he was governor, he's back doing movies now, I see. When he tried to slash funding for the home care program, home care workers through their union were able to organize and unite with disability rights workers and disability rights organizations and senior groups to stop the cuts, even participating in civil disobedience. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? At the federal level, they want an administrative rule change so that home care workers could finally get overtime pay. And when President Obama passed the Affordable Care Act, those unions stepped up and signed up thousands of providers in California, acting as a navigator to help people figure out 
how to get coverage under ACA. Ultimately, the biggest change for home care providers in California was the fact that they now had a, a way to, together to speak up, to speak out with one voice. They had a means to express their needs, a means to express their demands through collective bargaining. I've got an old saying. As a matter of fact, I was at the White House a couple of months ago. I was with the president, and he was speaking at a worker summit conference. And I was sitting in the audience. I had just met with him, and he said, uh, I've got a quote that a good friend of mine uses. He said, I just met with him. Lee Saunders is in the audience somewhere. And he said, here's his quote. If you don't have a seat at the table, then you're on the menu. <laughs> I say that all the time. Matter of fact, I sent him a bill for using my quote, but I haven't gotten anything back. I haven't gotten any, any change at all. In a 2013 Supreme Court case called Harris versus Quinn, a case considered the predecessor to the Friedrichs case that I was just talking about, the justices ruled five to four that home care providers are not public employees in the full sense. The Supreme Court called them quasi-employees. Now what the hell does that mean? quasi-employees. I guess that makes them, well, I guess that makes sense since they've only been earning a quasi-living for many, many years. But we are turning the tide, and home care workers across this country are gaining dignity and respect through their unions, through the collective bargaining process. The ruling had the effect of turning the entire home care and child care sectors right to work overnight. But that didn't stop them. It didn't stop us. The goal, at least our enemies thought the goal was to be to weaken their voices, to weaken their unions. Yet the ruling let back basic collective bargaining rights stand so we could still continue to bargain collectively. Today, more than two years on, Home care providers in California still have their union, and they are still collectively bargaining, and they are still getting wages and benefit improvements all over that great state. That is the importance of collective bargaining. Now, what's the lesson? I went through that example to come to this conclusion. The lesson here is even in a right-to-work setting, which the Friedrichs ruling may institute for the entire public sector in the United States. Collective bargaining works if working people stick together, if working people understand the value of collective action, understand the value of collective bargaining, understand the value and the importance of being active members of a union. It's particularly important an important lesson is we struggle to build worker power and balance in the gig economy. Whoever you're talking about, whether it's Uber drivers or other independent providers who have no benefits, who are working with low wages, we've got to consider ways and be creative just as we were with home care workers to represent them. That was a collective bargaining model that we instituted in the state of California that we are instituting across this country. You know, I'm convinced, and we'll be a little bit self-critical here, I'm convinced that we've lost sight of a number of things over the years, meaning the labor movement meaning the leaders of the labor movement, meaning our activists. Too often, we take our rank and file members, good people. They believe in their unions. And we kind of push them aside. We only deal with our, our leaders. We only deal with our activists. Well, I would suggest to you that we've got to change that in the labor movement that we've got to figure out ways to communicate in a better way, 
to talk with our activists and members and non-members alike, to listen to them, to hear their concerns, to talk with them about the importance of collective action, of coming together, of having power, to go against or to fight the issues that confront all of us. So we've done some soul searching in AFSME, and we've started to lay out a program and lay out a plan starting in 2014. We call it AFSME Strong. That AFSME Strong program is real simple. It's going back to the basics. It's basic 101 organizing. Well, you know what we do? We talk to members. And we talk to our non-members and ask them to participate and be more active in their union. And we do it through one-on-one -on -one communication. Not in group settings. I mean, you still have the meetings. But, you, you know, sometimes you've got to look folks dead in the eye. You've got to talk to them. You've got to put away that iPhone and that iPad and talk with people. Listen to them and what their concerns are. Now, we're a big union, 1.6 million members strong, but we are committed to talk to 80% of our members membership by July of this year, one-on-one -on -one communication. One-on-one -on -one communication. You know what? It's working. In those areas where we concentrated on when we first developed our campaign, we went into the areas where we had a lot of folks who were non-members. They were in the bargaining unit getting all those benefits and the increases and contract protections, but they weren't members. And we talked with them, and we asked them to join their union because it is their union. We set a goal in 2014 when we started this program that by 2014, in the month of June, at our Chicago convention, then we would have organized 50,000 new members into AFSCME. A little more than five months. By accepting that model, by committing ourselves to that model of one-on-one -on -one communication. Well, we walked into that convention in Chicago, not 50,000 stronger, but 190,000 stronger because of that communication. And we didn't stop there. We didn't stop there. We continued under our Ask Me Strong program. And now we are 260,000 stronger. Folks just want to be talked to. They want to have a voice, but they want to know that you're listening to them. And they want to be asked. Many times we would knock on the door, say who we are, and I've participated in this too. Everybody in the union is doing this. And the comment that will come from the person that we're talking to is this. I've been with the union for 15, 20 years, and I've never been approached this way. I've never had the opportunity to talk with my representative. And you sit down and you talk to them, and they will become members and active members. Again, it's not rocket science. It's getting back to basics. That's what our internal organizing program is, is all about. This renewed focus on internal organizing is causing a, a cultural shift. It really is. It's causing a cultural shift in AFSCME where public service workers, even the smallest of units, smallest of locals, are empowering themselves to make change. Rather than wait for someone from, quote, the union to do it for them. Consider Regina Freeman, an air pollution control specialist in Louisville, Kentucky. Regina's unit is only 25 people within a local of 800 in a city and state where the public sector is completely right to work. Prior to AFSCME Strong, the local membership stood near zero. 
Nobody was a member. Not too healthy. Today, based upon AFSCME Strong, based upon that communications program, every single one is an AFSCME member in good standing, 100%. This works. It works. And when Regina was asked about the value of org organizing, this is what she said, and I quote, by talking with our co-workers and taking action at work, we've not only grown our membership, we've also taken on issues and, and we've won. In my unit alone, we stopped layoffs by putting pressure on management to find other solutions. In other words, in my local, we got the city to hire more workers for the juvenile detention center and settled contracts that were outstanding for two years because we had collective power. And the employer saw that. I have seen what can happen when we organize, and I am proud to say that Local 2629 is now AFSCME strong. That's just one example of what we're doing across the country. Our renewed focus on internal organizing has made us stronger for whatever, whatever the future holds. It's what we had to do. It's what we must continue to do. Now, that's not to say it's easy. This is one of the hardest things that AFSCME has ever done. And it's required change from all of us, from the top down. And AFSCME, we're working to shift the view of those leaders and staff from being service providers to, to being organizing coaches. That means they are coaching others to have meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversations with coworkers, not staff, not officers talking to the workers, but coworkers talking to coworkers, <laughs> listening to them, asking them to join to look at building power by any means necessary. And not just through the grievance procedure or the bargaining process, but rebuilding, rebuilding AFSCME, rebuilding a labor movement. And I would say this, we must rebuild not only the labor movement, but we've got to rebuild a movement in this country to represent the aspirations of working families, not just within unions, but those who do not belong. I noted a moment ago that unions, and AFSCME included, we tended to focus our communications on our activists. And then we would sometimes talk to our members and we would talk to them like they were activists. Well, I've got to tell you, most of our members are not activists. They're good people. They believe in their union. They want to be a part of their union, but their plates are full. They're doing other things. So we've got to, to change our language to reflect that. Not treating them as activists, but treating them as members and asking them to be a part of something bigger. You know, the stretch to the wall. Our members are stretched to the wall. Working families are stretched to the wall, trying to make ends meet. So we can't expect that they will give 100% of their time to their union. But if we talk to them, they'll give some time, some quality time to their union. So we've realized that. We had to stop talking. We had to start listening. That's what it's all about. So in 2015, we dug deeper than ever before. I think that we have an understanding now of where our members are, what they're talking about, what they want out of their union, because it is their union, what they want out of their lives. And these results will help us not only survive, survive but thrive no matter the outcome, no matter what happens with Friedrichs. And we'll know shortly enough, it'll be, the case will be rendered uh, in June, probably of 2016, of this year, whether Abood will be overturned or not. 
We've identified about 35% of our membership as being activists. They know right to work is a fraud. They prefer an ownership model over a transactional model when it comes to their union. And they believe wholeheartedly in the power and the language of trade unionism, collective action, solidarity, sisterhood, and brotherhood. But we also identified about 50% of our members who view themselves as self-starters or who feel disconnected to traditional appeals of trade unionism and collective action. That individual ruggedness that exists in this country, not bad. So we've got to talk to them and communicate them with them in a different way. These individuals want to belong just like anyone else. And they do understand when we probe, they understand the importance of being a part of the union. They want their union to recognize their personal contributions to public service, not a collective, but their individual, their personal contributions to public service. They want solidarity without conformity. That's what we're finding among 50% of our membership. So we've got to reach these folks. We've got to talk to them about the importance of recognizing their need to be individuals, recognizing their need to be honored as individuals in the work that they do every single day. But we've got to touch them and say that there's something else that you should do. And that is to be a part of a collective, to work with your union sisters and brothers to achieve the benefits that you so deserve. We're going through this transition right now within AFSCME. But we're also recognizing a couple of things, and I'm going to close so we can have a, a discussion, so you can ask questions or even respond to the kinds of things that I'm saying. You heard me say that the private sector right now is down to 6.7% organized. Public sector is 35%, but if we lose Friedrichs, then that number is going to substantially decline. We cannot engage in battle. We cannot engage in this fight alone. Labor cannot do this alone. Whether we're talking about organizing campaigns or legislative pushes or electoral politics, our tendency too often was to go it alone. Not work with our allies and coalition partners. Develop a strategy, develop a plan to deal with the issues that confront not only us, but all working families. We've got to do that. We've got to do a better job at that. Coalition building working outside of our movement. I mean, the bad folks have been very, very good at tearing us apart, dividing and conquering. Let me just give you one example. Public pensions. Right now, in the public sector, we're still lucky enough through battle, through fights, through collective action, in most cases, we still have a defined benefit program. But those programs are under attack in state after state after state for a variety of reasons. And all of those reasons have nothing to do with the employee. It has to do with choices of the employer. But what they've been able to do is this. Public sector worker in a community lives next door to a private sector worker. That private sector worker maybe even had a defined benefit program at one time, but it was taken away. Maybe that person is a retiree that was from the private sector who's seen the retirement benefits diminished. You're looking at defined contribution programs taking the place of defined benefit programs. And what you've got is this private sector worker retiree sitting next door or living next door to the public sector worker saying, whoa, whoa, you've got a good retirement. 
or you're going to have a good retirement. You're going to have a guaranteed benefit. And I don't have that. I am scuffling just to have a retirement at all. In fact, many will tell you that they're living off of Social Security. And what's worse is they'll say, and not only do you have it, but I'm a taxpayer and I'm paying for it. I'm paying for something that you have that I don't have. That's a very effective argument. But I submit to you this. I mean, we've got to sift through. There aren't any kids in the room, are they? We've got to sift through the bullshit, okay? And I'm convinced of this. The question should not be, well, you've got a defined benefit program. I don't, so you shouldn't have it, and why do you have it? We've got to flip that question and say, I've got a defined benefit program. I'm going to keep that defined program, and we're going to figure out a way that you get it too. That should be the question. That should be our motivation. But they've been so successful in pitting working people against working people, and we cannot fall for that trap. And I mentioned the pension piece because we've gotten smarter. When our pensions are under attack, now we're working with small business owners. Because let me tell you something, if the retirees don't have the money to spend, the small businesses in those communities suffer. The economy suffers in those communities. So we're working outside of labor, being creative and dealing with that pension issue. We can go on and on about what we're doing collectively within labor and outside of labor. Fast track TPP is another example where we're thinking outside the box. This is not just a labor union issue. This is an issue that impacts on working families and the loss of jobs in this country. And we're working with organizations outside of labor, the Sierra Club, the NAACP, a whole list of organizations who support our position that these trade agreements hurt American workers, and we're going to continue to fight every single day. You know, we've got to work in coalition as far as Friedrichs is concerned. We've got to educate and mobilize our members. We've got to educate and mobilize and organize our communities all over the country. I've logged over a quarter million miles crisscrossing the country since I was elected president of AFSCME in June of 2012. And I have yet to meet a cafeteria worker who does not want a voice on the job, union or not union. I have not met a cafeteria worker who doesn't want a voice, doesn't want a seat at the table. I've yet to meet a social worker who does not want a safe and secure workplace. I've yet to meet a transportation employee who does not want to level the playing field with management. The reason is the value of the labor movement is enduring. It really is enduring. It's about the simple yet profound idea that together, together collectively, we are stronger. It's about the need to make individual lives better in a concrete way. It's about shifting the balance of power from bosses to workers, from the ridiculously wealthy to the unfairly impoverished, from the ruling class to the working class. Now, I don't underestimate or trivialize the legal, political, and legislative challenges before us. I know that they are huge. Make no mistake about it. But I'll tell you what, I will not wring my hands or worry whether this moment in our history is labor's last stand. And you shouldn't either. If we are willing to look honestly at ourselves and embrace, embrace change, Embrace reforms. If we are ready to abandon the tactics that don't work and experiment with and embrace the tactics that do work, if we're willing to do that, if we are ready to seize this moment in history, then I believe, sisters and brothers, that we will rediscover 
collectively we will rediscover the value of labor, the value and importance of our movement, not only for our members within, labor, within the labor movement, but for working families all over the country. That's our charge. That's our responsibility. That is what we must do. And we will do it. Because I have hope, you have hope, and it is time. People are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you see people rising up, whether it's the fight for 15, whether it's fast food workers standing up and saying enough is enough, going back to those sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968 with that sign that said, I'm a man and I deserve dignity and respect. All of us deserve dignity and respect, and damn it, we will fight for it every single day. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll let, I'll let you direct questions, okay? And, uh, Okay, okay. Elaine's giving me orders, as she always does. Okay, we've got a little bit of time uh, for questions or comments. Just don't throw anything at me, okay? I'm getting old. It's hard for me to duck. Sister. We've got a mic. It's coming to you. We have a mic, and uh, could you introduce yourself? And um, My name is Desiree Goodwin. I'm a member of a union here. Um, I've talked to a lot of union members, and many of us are really frustrated by the sense of the lack of futility of our union leaders, that, that they must accept concessions, and we're getting less and less in our benefit packages. And, um, you know, looking at the big picture, and I, I talked to other people who are members of unions outside of Harvard, and they say it's happening everywhere, and everyone just seems to be resigned that it's happening everywhere. So we have to accept a little cut. And then what are we going to have to accept next? A little more, a little more, give away a little more. It's, it's very frustrating. We just see our rights sliding away from us. And, um, <laughs> and, and then you look at globalization and jobs being transported overseas, and that's our competition. And it, it just seems like our leaders have a real sense of futility that they're passing along to the membership. Well, I think that's what we've got to change. Can everybody hear me here? I, I think that we've got to change. And there'll be times, quite honestly, when, uh, when you may have to accept uh, concessions, but there are other times when we shouldn't. And I'll just give you an example of the commitment and the dedication that was shown by workers right here at Harvard, okay, with Haktu, uh, where they were able to fight and they were able to achieve a good contract with wage increases, with no loss in benefits, and we've been able to do that across the country. But what it takes is not giving up, but what it also takes is organization. And what it also takes is building a structure that will support you when you've got to go into battle. And that's what it's all about. It's about going into battle. If you don't have that structure that's in place, then you're going to be taken advantage of. So that's what's so important about communicating with our members talking with, to them about the issues, talking to them about the importance of being together, talking to, to them about the importance of collective action, show you, so you're showing power. And I think that people back up when you show power. But what we haven't done is to be creative enough and to be bold enough to show power and to develop power. And once you do that, then I think that you can change a number of things. Um, and it's hard. And this is not easy work. And it really is rebuilding. And it's rebuilding the trust and the commitment of individuals within that union. But you've got to do it. Because if we don't do it, then we're going to be faced with exactly, sister, what you said, with folks shoving stuff down our throats and our leaders and our members just saying, well, nothing's going to change. And they're accepting the inevitable. We cannot accept the inevitable. We've got to develop tools and a plan and a strategy to fight back. And to say no, that might, might be civil disobedience. It could be a strike. I mean, it could be a variety of things. It could be going to the legislature, le legislature, you know, rallying, doing phone calls. I mean, putting all kinds of pressure 
on whoever you need to. But Frederick Douglass used to say this, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. There's got to be struggle. And we've got to have that fire in our belly to be willing to fight and to, yes, sometimes be willing to take a chance and to take a stand. And I've got to tell you that I think a lot of folks have, are not taking stands right now. And we have the ability to do so if we have confidence in one another and confidence in ourselves. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to deal with this. The only way. Now, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's what we're doing in AFSME and it's working. It's working. Uh, first, uh, thank you, President Sanders, for your presentation. My name is Mike Dintanasanto. I'm a registered nurse and a member of Mass Nurses Association, Unit 7, State Chapter of Healthcare Professionals, representing the healthcare professionals that work for the Commonwealth of Mass. MA is an affiliate member of National Nurses United, one of the first unions to endorse Bernie Sanders for president. My question for you is, is how did the Executive Council come to that decision, given that you have to know that some of your locals are defying the national endorsement and, and supporting Bernie Sanders. Robert Reich, a Massachusetts economist uh, and Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton, recently said that Hillary is the right candidate for the government we have. Bernie Sanders is the right candidate for the government we should have. So respectfully, and pardon my language, I just personally, as a labor leader in Massachusetts, feel that these type of endorsements are the politics as usual, endorse the most likely candidate bullshit that's undermining unions right now in this country. Well, I appreciate the, um, the question. Uh, let me, I just came from Iowa uh, a couple of days ago, and I'm going back, as a matter of fact, on Saturday. Um, Asked me endorse Hillary Clinton. Uh, and it wasn't me endorsing Hillary Clinton. It wasn't the executive board uh, endorsing Hillary Clinton. Uh, we went through the most in-depth and exhaustive process, and Frank was sitting at the table, and he knows everything that we've done. Uh, Henry Greedo from District Council 37, executive director of 37, knows exactly what we did. We did poll after poll after poll of our members. At every meeting that we had, of our affiliate conventions and conferences and national meetings, we did polls there. We invited folks to get on our website and tell us who they wanted us to support, or maybe not support anybody, but just wait it out. Uh, so we went through an exhaustive process. We had town hall meetings in Iowa, where we had uh, Senator Sanders, where we had Governor O'Malley and Secretary Clinton speak to our members, but we live streamed it across the country. So all of our members had the opportunity to participate in the process. All of our members had an opportunity to participate in the website poll and all the other polls that we were doing, the conferences that we, uh, that, uh, that we had. It wasn't even close, brother, I mean, as far as our members are concerned. Uh, and that's who guides us. It's not an individual. It's not me. I mean, I personally uh, think that all three are great. I, I really think that Hillary Clinton has the best chance of winning, okay? But I will tell you this, I'm not going to get into a bloodbath when I'm in Iowa, and I was there a couple of days ago, and when I go back, I'm not criticizing the Democratic candidates, because all three of them would be are, and are a world of difference when you look at the Republican candidates, okay? So we can have, I think we can have an honest and respectful debate about what we think, but again, I mean, we went through a process that was a very lengthy process, and that made the determination for us who we should endorse. Other unions did the same kind of thing. I know that your union, uh, and I know your leader very, very well, uh, Roseanne, uh, you know, she went through her own process, okay? The, here's, the, here's the deal, man. Here's the deal. Um, you look at the Democrats who are running. We know Bernie Sanders. I've known him a long, long time. I've known Martin O'Malley a long, long time when he was mayor of Baltimore, governor of, of Maryland. Obviously, we've known Hillary Clinton a long, long time. What we've got to make sure that we do, because I am telling you, it is scary out there, okay? The stuff that is coming out of the mouths of these Republicans, I mean, it's just unbelievable to me. Unbelievable to me. And if there is any question in anybody's minds in this room that if, in fact, one of them, Trump, Cruz, any of them, 
I mean, you listen to what Trump has to say, and he's gaining more popularity. And for those who think that he's just a flash in the pants, you're wrong. You're wrong. This guy's got some juice, and we need to pay attention to him. But you look at that crop. They will take us back so far. I don't even want to think how far they'll take us back. Those three candidates on the Democratic side, their values are the same. They might have some differences of opinions, but we can't tear each other apart because one of those three is going to be the Democratic candidate. And in the end, all of us are going to have to get behind that candidate. Depending upon what, you know, what process we took, I respect your process, you've got to respect ours. Just like we've got to respect any other union's process that did the kind of due diligence that I believe that we did. But in the end, all of us have got to come together. All of us have got to come together, because if we don't, we will have hell to pay in January of 2017. Supreme Court, three or four justices are going to be gone. That's just human nature. I mean, the odds are that three or four will be gone. You want a Trump or a Cruz or a Rubio to nominate someone on the Supreme Court? Come on. I mean, they've got control of a lot of the state legislatures and governor's offices right now. What we've got to do is, it's not only important on the national level, but we've got to recommit ourselves to fight at the state and local government level to get appropriate governors and the right governors and the right mayors in office. Okay? This is not just a national fight. I mean, these folks have been strategic as far as what they have done. State legislatures. Governors, coming after us. Don't let this issue divide. Don't let this issue divide us. It can't. We've got to come together after it's all over with, okay? And if we do that, and that's what they want. They want to continue to divide us. We can't fall for that trap. So uh, I'm comfortable with the decision that we made and the process that we took, just as I'm sure that you're comfortable within your own union of the process that you took. There are unions that are supporting Bernie. There are unions that are supporting Hillary. But in the end, all of us have got to come together. Is that fair? Thank you, brother. Me, for, me first? Oh, yeah, Jim Gleason. Um, you mentioned the 99% that, who want to play by the rules. And yet last fall, you endorsed Obama's uh, executive order granting uh, a de facto amnesty to over 4 million uh, illegal aliens who don't play by the rules. Maybe his executive order as well isn't playing by the rules. We'll find out in a few months. You've also endorsed virtually every blank and amnesty program proposed in the Congress for people who do not play by the rules. Now, most of your members' uh, salaries and uh, your consequent uh, union dues come from public money, uh, which is uh, paid to them. Uh, and you appear now uh, due to uh, use that to undermine the laws and borders of this country. How can you have a society functioning for workers or anyone else without secure borders and without a reliable rule of law? How can you reward people who are knowingly breaking the rules? Well, I respectfully disagree with you, brother. Um, um, you know, I think that um, what President Obama has tried to do, in my mind, is not enough. Okay? Uh, in my mind, you have got people in this country who are living in the shadows, who have been here for a long, long time, who have proven their worth. And I think that it is un-American, and I think that it is undemocratic not to recognize that these are people's lives. And we should develop ways in which, appropriate ways, with checks and balances, to make them citizens of this country. It's just as simple as that. So, and that has a direct impact on workers in this country because as long as you have individuals working in this economy with low wages, with no benefits, then it undermines those 
who have higher wages and higher benefits. It brings us down. And it's the same argument that I used before with the pensions. I mean, we're a better country than this. We are still, brother, the richest country on the face of the earth. And it is unacceptable in my mind to bring people down, to bring workers down, and try to create havoc rather than saying enough is enough. And you're right, that 99% start standing up, and they are starting to stand up and say that this economy is rigged, it's not fair, and we aren't going to take it anymore. And that includes everyone, including those individuals that you're talking about. So we just respectfully disagree on that point. <clears throat> My name is Edie Brickman, and I'm from Brookline, so I know Mr. Maroney. And I will tell you one thing that uh, I would say that I always say to people when they say, why do we have pensions for our, uh, our workers in the town of Brookline? And I say, they do not get Social Security. Do not forget, everybody else gets Social Security. A lot of ASME workers do not get Social Security. <laughs> the other thing that I will tell you that I had to work with a few other people by joining the financial committee and trying to tell the town no outsourcing. That was not addressed today. But you have to tell, and I had to tell people, when you outsource, you are paying these companies if you are getting the work done at a less amount of money, it is on the backs of workers. And we in towns and cities should not agree to that. I appreciate what the sister did. Let me just clarify one thing uh, that she stated. Um, in a number of state governments and local governments, uh, public service workers working for those entities uh, do not receive Social Security. Uh, that is not a fact for all state governments or local governments. Some, uh, in fact, the, the majority of state governments and local governments do pay into the Social Security program, but many, uh, many do not. Uh, and you're right. For those who, have not, uh, who do not pay into the Social Security program, uh, then you're relying purely on the amount that you pay into your state or local government insurance uh, pension program. So... Uh, and that's another argument that, uh, you know, obviously that we can use. So, uh, but I just wanted to clarify that point, okay? Uh, hello, I'm Henry Garrido, Executive Sorry, Director. <laughs> Henry Garrido, Executive Director, Garrido Council 37, New York City. Uh, I just want to say for the record, no human being is ever illegal, whether documented or not. To deny the contributions that immigrants have made to this country is to deny history. But on to the issue at hand. I am a testament to the work that the Ask Me Strong campaign has brought to New York City. In 2004, we had 28,000 agency fee payers, people who did not or chose not to belong to the unions. By talking to them, we've been able to cut that number by more than half in a year. We are now at 13,000 and still going down. We have about 20,000 people we've talked to, and I think that even having worked in the union for over 20 years, what's coming out collectively has been very revealing to me about what the do's and don'ts and the things that the members expect or the things we think that they think. Uh, this has been very clear to me. But I guess my question to you as a leader, and I thank you for your leadership, is more director at the Supreme Court. I was there that Monday on January 11th when the oral arguments were taking place inside. But we've seen one of the most activist court in the history of this country, whether it is you know, voters' rights or, or, or Citizens United or a number of other cases that have had a tr profound effect uh, across the, the work that, the, you know, and the effect of working people. My question is, it's a question in the minds of many people like myself was, is there still time to influence this court to not undo one of the most important rulings that we've seen 
in over four decades. I mean, Henry, there's always time, and uh, we're going to use that time up until the last minute uh, to try to influence the court. Obviously, it's a different kind of strategy because you aren't dealing with elected officials. I mean, you aren't dealing with the governor. You aren't dealing with the state legislature. I mean, you, you're dealing with folks who are appointed, you know, for life, okay? Uh, so it's not like we can say, well, we're going to vote you out of office next time you run. Well, they don't, I mean, they aren't running. But you're right. I think that the what we can do is to put as much pressure on them. And I think Roberts reacts to this because he reacted to it uh, with the ACA decision, uh, where he doesn't want his court to be viewed as a political court. Now, it is, okay? But he, he doesn't want to cross that line, that whatever that line might be for him. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to, uh, to put pressure uh, on the court uh, through a public relations campaign. Uh, we're working very, very closely with um, uh, the National Education Association, with AFT, uh, SEIU, and AFSCME. We have a coalition. Uh, those are the four, well, those are the four, uh, you know, one of the, the four of the largest unions in this country, uh, but the four largest public sector unions in this country. At one time, uh, we used to fight one another and organize against one another and spend millions of dollars against one another. Well, that, those days are gone. We're working very, very closely together. Uh, and we're coordinating our resources, coordinating uh, our ability to, to fight back, working very closely with, uh, with those unions. And matter of fact, I've got a meeting with the three presidents uh, next week. Um, so we're coordinating a plan and working with the AFL-CIO and with our community partners uh, to try to put political pressure uh, on the Supreme Court. One of the things that we're doing is that we have made a, uh, a decision based upon focus groups and polling uh, that the leaders not be out front on this issue because once we are, then it'll turn into an argument about all, the only thing they're, reason they're saying this is because they want dues. Right. They, want, you know, they want those resources coming into the till. Uh, so we've made a concerted effort, all four unions, uh, to use as spokespersons, and you know this because we've used some folks from 37, uh, to use as spokespersons members. Uh, actual members who are providing vital public services who are members of unions. And they talk about the value of collective bargaining and the value of the work that they perform every single day. And we've kind of stepped aside and moved into the background and let our members talk. Now, we're doing training programs uh, for our members, uh, so they are saying the right kind of things. Uh, and uh, we're working with them very, very closely. But we're going to continue the pressure on uh, until that decision is rendered. And again, that decision will probably be rendered uh, between April of this year and June, no later than June of 2016. So we aren't taking our foot off the pedal, uh, but I think that we've also got to be realists too. Uh, and I will say this. Um, I don't anticipate that the ruling will be a good one. Okay, that's just my own personal opinion, but it's also based upon what happened uh, in the oral arguments, uh, I think that Abood will be overturned, okay, and that's going to, that means the public sector is going to take a hit, okay? I mean, as much as we're doing within AFSCME, we know that we're still going to lose members. And every other public sector union is going to lose members. That's not going to be healthy, not only for the public sector, but it's not going to be healthy for the private sector, because you heard me talk about the figures and the representation uh, in the private sector. I mean, this could very well be, if we don't change the way that we're doing things, I mean, folks are hoping that this is going to be the death knell for labor. I don't think it will be, because I think we're smart enough, and we're brave enough, and we're bold enough to figure this out. Uh, but you've got uh, the trade union movement working together on this. Uh, you've got our coalition partners. We even had a number of Republican legislators, some out of Pennsylvania and other states, uh, who support it Abood staying in place, who supported our position. And they did briefs to the Supreme Court because collective bargaining gives them order. I mean, it gives them order in the workplace. And they believe that it's just nutty to take it away uh, and to have a system where it's being torn apart. So we're just going to continue to do it, man, and uh, hope for the best. But this is something in the process that AFSCME is doing and what we're doing as far as communicating with members, I got to tell you, even without 
Friedrichs, we would have been doing this anyway. And I think that every union should be doing this. I mean, maybe we're doing it a lot quicker because of the pressures that we're on, but it's something that all of us must need, must do. I mean, we can't be afraid to look at the mirror and say, well, that looks good, or that looks real bad, and we've got to fix it. And we've got to come up with different kinds of programs because this is an, a changing environment. We're dealing with a changing workplace. We're just dealing with a changing workforce, and we've got to make the, those, uh, those adaptations. Uh, and uh, so we will be going through this process with or without Friedrichs, okay? Hi, I'm um, Maria Cirillo. I'm from Sydney, Australia, and I'm the Director of Organising at um, the Public Service Association there. Um, I le first learnt about your AFSME Strong campaign just a couple of nights ago from a few of your leaders, Andrew Washington, Joyce Carlson and Jeremy Sanders, and it um, really excited me. I'm keen to hear um, perhaps what advice would you give us if we wanted to go back and um, pursue a similar initiative for our union there? Well, I mean, the first thing that we did, uh, and I'll just give you our experience, um, we called all of our uh, leaders from around the country together, uh, not just our executive board, uh, but our leaders. Uh, we had affiliate leaders. We had local union leaders. Frank was there. Uh, Henry was there. Uh, I think uh, Mike, uh, Mike was there. I mean, we had a lot of folks that came, uh, and we sat down and we talked about what we needed to do. And... Uh, the things that were working and the things that weren't, uh, and what our plan and what our strategy should be. And we spent, I guess, in the first meeting, and we've had these meetings now every year, uh, for three days, we've argued and cussed and disagreed, but in the end of that third day, we came together uh, to talk about a plan and to talk about a program. The first thing that's absolutely necessary is that you have buy-in. Okay, and that everybody walks out that door believing that this is something that must take place. If you walk out that door and there's still questions, or folks are saying, okay, that was a nice three days, now we're going back to business as usual, then it's not going to work. We actually had buy-in. Now, are there different levels of buy-in? Yes. No question. I mean, there are. But what we've got to do is we've got to look at the examples where the folks have bought in and they've worked with us to develop a program and they've had major successes. Henry just mentioned the success in New York City. And we've had successes all over the country. And in that way, when you show that it can be done, it's not impossible, then you start going to the folks that said, okay, well, we believe this, but we don't know if it can be done. And we can say, here's the example, and you can do it too. And then you just build upon it. But you've got to have buy-in from the group, understanding that we've got to make a change. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ekaterina Yordanova. I'm a president of the Federation of Transport Trade Unions in Bulgaria. But as well, I'm a member of, our, of the executive board of our confederation, National Confederation, and a member of the executive board of International Tra Transport, Un uh, Transport Workers Federation. And um, my question, I actually, I, I have two questions, but I would start uh, by saying that I am really, really happy and privileged to be here, and I would like to thank you for this opportunity. It is a great opportunity for me and from my colleagues from Europe, Australia, and Canada to be here. Uh, I would like to start by... Um, saying that the three weeks now we here are listening our colleagues from Canada and United States and when you're talking about international you're talking about United States and Canada and you said that and it is the truth and this is the reality you are the richest nation in the world and you are exporting practices you are exporting good practices and best practices and bad practices as well. Because you exported to our part of the world Uber. <laughs> Uber. And you exported many multinationals and corporations. And these clever people, they have their agenda and the business in the capital, they have their very strict and very wise agenda. They fight with us. 
very severely in our part of the world. While I have a feeling that we still have a lot to do to be more united. And, he, and we really miss you, our, your, our brothers and sisters from United States and Canada. We miss you on the international arena. We want you to be more visible and to export your knowledge and to be with us because when we need to fight Uber, we need you to tell them back home that they do not behave properly in their own country. And we, our words and our fight will be more successful if we are fighting together with you. We have to fight together with you more actively in international labor organization. And I, I believe that we have to work a lot to build a strong front together, worldwide. And at the end, I would like to share with you that my other field and my other big topic is a working woman. And working women need a space. And we would rely on you if your candidate become a president of the richest and the strongest country in the world, she defends the working women rights and you give us a chance to have her on our side. Thank you. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that um, you're exactly right. I mean, this is not only a problem in this country, uh, it's not only a problem in Canada, but it's worldwide because there's a global economy right now. Uh, and in the public sector, I'll just give you an example, uh, where we are faced with uh, the privatization of wastewater uh, systems. Uh, that's an international problem because there are international conglomerates that are doing that. So it's incumbent upon us to share information and work more closely uh, with our sisters and brothers in, in Europe and across the globe uh, because we're faced with the same kinds of issues. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick story, something that we just did uh, within AFSME. Uh, in November, we had a meeting of an organization called Public Services International, uh, which is uh, an alliance. Uh, weren't you there? Did you come to that? Or what? The Food Union Federation. Okay. Um, but we had uh, uh, public service unions represented from around the world come to AFSME, and we talked about privatization and the contracting out of public services and what we can do jointly and how we can coordinate our activities because it's not just confined to one area. Uh, and we met for three days to talk about it and we pledged to continue to meet just so we could share the kind of information that is so helpful for others. I will say this, uh, there's no cookie cutter approach. I mean, uh, you know, our experience with AFSCME Strong works for us very well. I think that and I would urge every, any other union to take a look at what we're doing, but then adapt it to your own union, okay? Uh, but the concept and the premise, I think, is the same, but how you implement it, it could be different from union to union. But I think there needs to be much more co cooperation and coordination because we are dealing with the global economy, and it affects not only the private sector, but it also affects the public, uh, the public sector also. So uh, I, I think we've got, to, we've got to do more. There's no question. All right. Maybe just uh, one more, and then... Uh we do have a reception. You're all welcome to join it. So one more here. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Um, I have been a member of the Service Employee International Union for over 30 years. I'm retired now, so to speak, but I was very proud to be a member of the union for that long. Oh, my name is Arturo Reynoso. Um, what local? Uh, Arturo Reynoso. Oh, I'm an independent scholar, I guess, in okay. this place, yes. Uh, I had to respond to the fellow behind me uh, because it seems to me that we don't seem to know the history of this country when it comes to these places that have been exporting people as illegal. I just happen to be one of those people that came from one of those countries. And, and there are a lot of uh, books that talk about, you know, how exclusively the people in this country have actually gone out and really gotten all this richness that we talked about when you say that this, this is the richest country in the world. 
So my, my main recommendation is to really read and, and really get to a point where you can actually understand where these people come from and what actually the things. I am concerned because behind all of these people, there are a lot of kids that are getting the message they, daily that they are illegal in this country. And that's the next generation that is going to come to be the majority of this country. So I'm concerned that these kids are going to be lost in the process by this rhetoric here. Thank you. I think she's right on. I mean, it's uh... <laughs> I, I love that. The president who doesn't want to get the last word in, who actually does listen to members. Frank has always told me not to get the last word in. That guy's standing back there. I, All right. On behalf, me. <laughs> on behalf of the faculty, staff, uh, students, alumni, and friends of the Harvard Trade Union Program. I would like to thank you, Lee, Brother Lee, for and uh, I hope I I know you have to get home, uh, shovel snow. Uh, no, so fine. couldn't fine. resist that. Uh, but I hope you've got uh, some time for just some informal conversation. And uh, Mildred Wirth, Abigail Wirth will be, uh, you're all welcome. We have food and uh, a reception just next door. So thank you very much. Thank you.